Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. Welcome again to this channel by Mimog. You are watching a video series about electrocardiogram. In this video, we are going to learn about the first cardiac disorder, that is cardiac hypertrophy. But before we begin, it is important that I must stress that this content is going to be based on the fundamentals that we have covered from previous lessons regarding basics in ECG. So if you haven't watched those first, be sure to do so. My reference for this topic is the only EKG book you'll need by Malcolm S. Thaler. Let us begin. The ECG helps us to identify not only cardiac hypertrophies, but it also helps us to locate the site where these changes occur. We can divide this into atria and ventricles, both right and left. Any changes in the atria will happen in P wave because it indicates atrial depolarization. Such is the wave pattern if we look at the heart from lead 2 because it is somewhat parallel to the normal heart axis. And previously we also learned that we can divide this P wave into half. The first represents the right atrium and later represents the left. To differentiate right and left atrial hypertrophies, another useful lead that we can use is lead V1, because this lead generally is perpendicular to the normal heart axis. Perpendicular means the wave pattern will show an isoelectric biphasic P wave. With this, we can clearly separate the waves representing each atrium. In ventricle, the changes will be noticed in QRS complex since it indicates ventricular depolarization. Alright, three things to keep in mind. Generally, the changes associated with hypertrophies can be seen in the wave's amplitude, duration, and its axis. In regards to wave configuration, changes in amplitude means either it is closer or away from baseline. Duration means a wave will be wider or narrower. Changes in axis means the wave configuration that we normally see in one particular electrode may be seen in other electrodes. So if atria, we are talking about the P wave's amplitude, duration and its axis. And if ventricles, we are talking about the changes in QRX complex according to these three domains as well. Let's look at our first, the right atrial hypertrophy. We know that P wave is a combination of both right and left atrial depolarization. But what if we separate those two waves from each other? Let's say this green upward deflection is depolarization from right atrium, followed by another similar wave a moment later from left atrium in orange. You can see how these two curves actually make up another outer curve, which forms the P wave. We have identified the three changes seen in hypertrophy, which are amplitude, duration, and axis. So let's try to apply the first two components here to the right atrium. In hypertrophy, more muscle mass equals stronger electrical vector, hence higher amplitude and longer duration. This wave is followed by a normal left atrium depolarization in orange. A combination of these two, you'll get this pattern of P wave in black. So the P wave becomes taller, but notice that its overall duration is unaffected. The right atrium does depolarize longer, but it is not seen here because it is obscured by the depolarization wave from the left atrium. Now these are the changes that you will see if the electrode in this case, lead 2, is parallel to the heart axis. If we look at the heart from lead V1, since it is perpendicular to the heart axis, we will have this pattern instead. Unlike the normal isoelectric wave we have seen earlier in normal lead V1, the first half is deflected away from the baseline relatively more compared to the second half because of right atrial hypertrophy. So what we can conclude from this, first in right atrial hypertrophy, the P wave will be taller. But how tall? It should be more than 2.5mm from the baseline. These rules apply not only to lead 2, but to all the inferior leads, including lead 3 and lead AVF. So if any of these inferior leads show this pattern, that suggests right atrial hypertrophy. We understood why lead 2 is used, but why lead 3 and AVF? We'll look into that in a moment. The second component is duration, but overall P wave here is not prolonged, so there is no change in duration. The third is regarding its axis. We know that collectively, in a normal heart, the P wave vector is directed averagely to somewhere around here, about 60 degree. But since there is right atrial hypertrophy, 
more muscle mass means higher electrical strength or vector, so we have to take into account another vector going in this direction as well. Now we have two vectors going to different direction. A combination of both, we will get a single vector that lies in the middle, somewhere in this quadrant. So in right atrial hypertrophy, we also can possibly see a right axis deviation of the P wave. If the hypertrophy is minimal, not to the extent that it changes the P wave axis, then perhaps we will see the tallest P wave in lead 2. If there is a gross hypertrophy that will change its axis to the right, we will see tallest P wave in lead 3. But if in between the two extremes, we may see the features in lead AVF instead. So that is why these three leads can be used for reference to look for this abnormality. Now let's look at left atrium. The basics are similar, we need to know how the normal P wave is constructed. But this time, we'll have a normal green curve for right atrium and a tall and wider orange curve for left atrium. Next is to construct our P wave again and we will have this pattern. This time, not only the P wave is taller, but also wider, unlike in right atrium. This is seen in lead 2. In lead V1, we have the reverse thing happen. Since the later half represents the left atrium, it is deflected from the baseline relatively more than the first half. In conclusion, the features for left atrium is a tall terminal part of T wave, so in lead 2, it will be more than 2.5 mm. Sometimes, it is difficult if we rely on lead 2 alone to differentiate right and left atrial hypertrophy because both shows tall T wave. And the skewness of the curve and the change in its width may not be that profound. Hence, we also use lead V1. In this lead, the downward deflection, if more than negative 1 mm, is enough to suggest left atrial hypertrophy. Secondly, as we have seen, the duration of P wave will be longer. So, more than 0.12 seconds or 3 small squares. Is there a change in P wave axis? Let us look at our heart. We'll first draw the normal vector for P wave, let's say around here, which is 60 degree because that is average. Since there is left atrial hypertrophy, we will also need to consider another vector going in this direction. If we combine these two, we'll get a single vector rightly around here, which is still in the normal axis quadrant. So for left atrium, there is no change in P wave axis. Alright, let's move on to right ventricle. Since we are talking about ventricle hypertrophy, now we will be focusing in changes in QRS complex. Precordial leads is more sensitive for showing ventricle hypertrophy compared to limb leads because the first is closer to our heart. But which leads should we use for reference? Let us quickly visit our previous lesson. These leads can be grouped according to the anatomical areas at which they observe the heart. V5 and V6 for left, V1 to V4 are considered anterior leads, but more specifically, V1 and V2 are for right ventricles, whereas V3 and V4 are for the septal wall. Again, remember that in previous lesson, we assumed that the heart axis lies exactly on V5. In a normal heart, it can be anywhere around V4 to V5. Since it lies generally to the left, so the R wave in lead V5 or V6 will be tall whereas the leads at the opposing end, which are V1 and V2, will record a small R wave but long S wave. So these two groups, the left lateral leads and the anterior leads for right ventricle, both will be useful to us. Let's say we choose one lead from each group, lead V6 for left ventricle and lead V1 for right ventricle. In a normal heart, these two leads will show us something like this. A quick revision, in case you forgot what these waves mean, the green is S wave showing septal depolarization, followed by R in orange and S in grey. Both represents ventricular depolarization. Lead V1 look from the opposing end of the heart axis, so it will record the opposite. And there will be no S wave here because the direction of septal depolarization is moving towards lead V1 in case you are wondering why there is no green wave here. In right ventricle hypertrophy, the right ventricle is bigger than the left. As we recall, more muscle mass means more electrical strength, so the vector for ventricular depolarization will be directed to the right instead of left. Depolarization away 
means there will be downward deflection recorded in lead V6 and depolarization towards means upward deflection recorded in lead V1. Again, these are the basics we learned previously in Fundamentals of ECG. If you have not watched those videos, this will be terribly confusing and complicated. Let's put our conclusion below. So to diagnose right ventricular hypertrophy in regards to amplitude, in lead V1, the R wave must be longer than the S wave. In lead V6, the S wave must be longer than the R wave. There is not much change in the duration of QRS complex, perhaps very minimal, so this characteristic is not that sensitive to identify right ventricular hypertrophy changes in ECG. In regards to the QRS axis, we will have right axis deviation because the vector going to the right ventricle now is more dominant than the left. Last one is the left ventricle. Let's put up the normal first so that we can compare. Lead V6 with tall R wave and a small S wave, and this is the opposite in lead V1. In right ventricular hypertrophy, it is easier to identify the ECG changes because they are very obvious since there is a profound change in the direction of vector. But in left ventricle hypertrophy, this is not rightly so, because in a normal heart, the left ventricle is already thrice the size of the right ventricle. So, in left ventricle hypertrophy, from lead V6, the R wave will be tall as usual, but its amplitude compared to a normal heart will be bigger, so we will have a longer R wave. Similarly, in lead V1, the pattern is the same, but the S wave amplitude will be bigger, so we will have longer S wave. But what is the cutoff point? For precordial leads, the R wave seen in left lateral leads, either V5 or V6, plus S wave seen in V1 or V2, must exceed more than 35 mm for us to say that there is left ventricular hypertrophy. This is perhaps the most common method to determine left ventricular hypertrophy. There are other methods, for example, if we use limb leads instead for our reference, the amplitude of R wave seen in lead AVL, which is part of left lateral lead, must exceed 13 mm. But since precordial leads is closer to the heart, these leads are more sensitive. For this, we actually have a lot of other guidelines or methods, but these two that I put up are the commonest according to Malcolm S. Athala. In terms of duration, Again, the changes are perhaps too minimal, so there are no specific criteria to suggest left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, regarding the QRS axis, in a normal heart, this is naturally directed at around 60 degrees. Since the left ventricle is larger than normal, instead of directing towards the heart apex at around 60 degrees, this is shifted more towards the left rather than towards the apex. That means the QRS axis will be deviated to the left instead. But similar to the right ventricle just now, we have different degrees of hypertrophy. So if there is only minimal hypertrophy, perhaps the axis will still be in the normal quadrant. In that case, referring to the changes in amplitude in left lateral leads and right ventricle leads will be helpful. That's it for now. In the next video, we will talk about myocardial infarction. If this video proves useful, hit the like button and share them with your colleagues. Subscribe for future videos. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.